And today we are really excited to have um, some a, a guest speaker who may be familiar to some of you. Um, our guest speaker is Dr. Ted Henry, and he used to be here at the University of Tennessee. Uh, but he currently is a professor of environmental toxicology ecology, and joined Harriet Watt University on the Global Platform for Research uh, Leaders in 2013. Uh, I am going to go ahead and copy and paste uh, Dr. Henry's um, full bio for you to have a look at more thoroughly. Uh, but in the interest of time, we'll go ahead and uh, turn the mic over to Dr. Hendry, who will present to us evidence and speculation on the effects of plastic particles on organism and human health. Thank you, Dr. Henry. So first of all, thank, thank you very much for inviting me. I, I'm, I'm always, always pleased to, to come back to, to Tennessee, even virtually. Um, and I, I will say, I, I, before I, I started this, this, this seminar, before I came online, I, I, I reviewed the one health initiative site that you have. And I just, my compliments to you all in, in what you're doing there. Um, I, I, this is, is the evolution of the Center for Wildlife Health. And, and I remember you know, being involved in the start of that back when I was there at, at uh, Tennessee. And I was there from, um, from 2004 to 2007, 2008. Um, and um, so it was, it was formative time for my career. I, I quite enjoyed it, have, have some very good colleagues that, that continue to be there and I continued to work with them over, over time. Uh, I left there and then went to the University of Plymouth, was there for five years. And then for about the last 10 years, I've been up here at, uh, at Edinburgh, um, working on a variety of different topics. But, but what I am gonna talk to you today about is some of the work we've been doing on, on plastics. And um, so, I'll take you forward for, for that. And I, and I guess, you know, this, this seminar is falling at your lunchtime. It's five o'clock in the, in the afternoon over here, but you're having your lunch over there. And this topic of plastics has gotten a lot of attention. And, and one of the, one of a recent article, this came out in the, uh, in the, in the peer reviewed literature, but this particular image and this reporting of it was in the newspaper, the guardian, which was, uh, which is a, it's a prominent UK, uh, newspaper, and they were reporting on that peer-reviewed article and giving, uh, you know, information to the public in, in in terms of what was found in that article. So I wanted to pull out a few things about that to sort of initiate our our discussion about plastics and the issues of plastics in the environment. And so the title of the Guardian article was that microplastics were found in human blood for the first time. Uh, that, that, that this discovery shows that particles can travel around the body and may lodge in, order, in, in internal organs. And so the, 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 the thing that has captured a lot of my attention since I've been working on plastics for the last uh, 10 years or so is, is the, the, how things get distorted in the media, how things get distorted in different contexts, where does the science lie, what is our role as scientists in this problem and in other problems when we're addressing these types of things. Um, in that Guardian article, there are a couple of quotes that I just pulled out from there, and, and I just bring our attention to that as, as scientists who are, who are working on, on a variety of topics you know, collectively within the room and, and, and people who are participating in this seminar. And, you know, so if, when you think about this topic of plastics and what was produced in this article, um, so, so yes, these, the, the article is reporting on these microplastic particles present in, in, in the blood of people that they tested. And some, some other quotes that appear in the article. And imagine the, the public perception that ends up emerging around the topic as a consequence of this type of information getting out. And you know, one thing here, the impact of, of uh, the impact on health is yet unknown, but research are cons researchers are concerned. Then a, a, a separate quote, air pollution particles are already known to enter the body and cause millions of early deaths a year. So that type of sentence captures a, per a, a, a certain impression in, in, in someone's mind as they read that. And then another sentence, unrelated to plastics, we also know in general that babies and young children are more vulnerable to chemical and particle exposure. That worries me a lot. Um, what's happening in the body? Are these, are these particles transported to certain organs? Are they getting into the blood-brain barrier? 
and what what are the what is the perception that that will give to to readers and and the 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 um, the readership of this Guardian article, and so it's something that we need to be conscious of, and and the nature of the the communications that get out for uh, for public consumption around this around the science. What is the role of scientists in that space? So this is the article, and let me just talk a few things about what they did to set the stage a bit. So that the article it set itself was really focused on developing an analytical method for detecting plastics uh, in blood. And the, one of the challenges of investigating the, the effects of plastics in organisms or humans is actually detecting them because the plastic particles themselves behave differently than traditional toxicants. Where traditional, traditional toxicants, we can extract them by different, different methods and analyze them. And we have very sophisticated methods for analyzing any number of, of, of substances that might be present in tissues. Particles have presented an additional challenge. And, um, and I've been working on the topic of engineered nanomaterials for, for prior to even to coming into the plastics topic. And this is this dealing with plastic with particles has been a challenging throughout uh, throughout that that period. Um, so this article focused on method development. Uh, they were they aimed to to uh, identify and quantify five different plastic polymers: this methacrylate, polypropylene, polystyrene, polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, and these are the the, the five prominent uh, plastics plastic polymers that are that are used to 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 make many of the things that we come in contact with every day. This was a a a, 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 a GCMS uh, method. Um, and if you're interested in that, read, you know, that article goes into a considerable detail. What they did was they co collected blood from 22 volunteers and they filtered that blood and that allowed them to sort of dis distinguish a, a size range of which particles which might have gotten into their sample for analysis is somewhere between 700 nanometers and 500 microns was the potential range of particle sizes that they, they um, were dealing with. They, they went to, to great uh, lengths to have quality control. This includes blanks, duplicates, spike recovery, and this type of thing. So this is one of the topics that's especially difficult to deal with in, in plastics and trying to address the, the, the contamination that can occur. So essentially there's plastic particles in, 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 in and that type of contamination is, is particularly difficult to, to deal with and having uh, blanks and duplicates and blanks throughout the process is 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 very important and they they reported a um uh, a limit of detection of right around uh just less than a, a microgram per milliliter uh uh per milliliter and a limit of quantification depending on the polymer of uh a, a bit less than a than a micro microgram per milliliter up to 2.3 micrograms per milliliter as the amount that they needed to to be able to see in order to quantify so what did they find? Um, so if we look at this, um, so they, they found polymers in the samples and, and this top, this, this figure here is a figure that I simply pulled from the, from the article just to show you. So the concentration in micrograms per, per milliliter on the, on the y-axis and then the individual blood samples on, on the x-axis. These different colors are simply indicating the amount of the individual polymer that they were, what they, that they were looking at. The, the, the sample numbers 1A, 1B, or 2A, 2B, these, are, these were duplicate samples. And so they split the sample and, and looked at half of it once and, and half of it the next time to see what, whether they could get repeatable answers. Um, and then, you know, so, so I think the, the take home there was that they, they were able to detect these different polymers in, in different blood samples and their method of, of detection was, was suitable at least for, for detecting these polymers. So, so we take that at face value and, and then they offer um, a mean summer, uh, sum of the polymer concentrations as uh, 1.6 micrograms per milliliter across all of these blood samples. So appreciate that you know, there's some variation there, but really of all of these, these uh, 22 pol uh, volunteers that gave their blood samples, they were detecting polymers, uh, and 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 this was the uh, the amount of of detection that they had in those samples. And um, so um, let me just get my 
system here working here. Uh, and so, um, so the question then comes, I, you know, I tell you that, and so what does this mean? So you can expect that if this, if their method is valid and, 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 and this is, this is all correct, this is the first time it's been done. So naturally there'll need to be some validation and some further, uh, experimentation to show what's happening here and if that can be repeated. But what does this mean for us? And so we might wonder, all right, well, how does this concentration compare to other substances that we might expect to be found in our blood as well? And, you know, as a toxicologist, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is recognize, first of all, everything is toxic. The question of toxicology is really about positioning the toxicity of one thing relative to another. This is more toxic than that. That's much less toxic than this. And so appreciating that, that order of, of toxicity. So what did, where do these plastics fall within this context? So I pulled, pulled a couple of values from, from some things that you might know. Um, and you know, if we look at total PCB uh, levels in, in these polychlorinated phenols, uh, persistent organic substance, um, less than two nanograms per milliliter. Um, the, the PFAS, this, this um, uh, polyfluoroalkylated substances, less than two nanograms per, per, per milliliter mercury levels. So these are some substances you might have heard of, persistent ones that are that are present in uh, in in and, and of human health concern in terms of their presence in in blood and tissues and. And um, some of these, of course, there are, are consumption advisories, for example, if, if you're eating, eating wild, wild uh, seafood and other, other types of things. So just to put into context, so we're talking these plastic particles quite a bit higher, 1.6 micrograms per milliliter compared to, you know, uh, a couple of nanograms per milliliter in these uh, other types of substances. Another article that came out, just to call your attention to this very recently in, in National Geographic, uh, also calling attention to, um, to microplastics and the environmental concerns and human health concerns of, of microplastics. What are the things that, that we need to, to worry about? Uh, and, and pointing out the, the, you know, some of the aspects of the question. They, they pulled a quote from some of our work, which was, which was on the, the, the um, I'll talk about this, and the plastic particles that are in marine mussels. And marine mussels are a, are a bivalve that, that, that people eat and they filter seawater and they can, they can ingest and accumulate uh, plastic particles in there. There's been a lot of work that has, has been done around detecting where plastic particles are, how many, how many, what the concentrations are in various environmental compartments. And they pull this quote saying, we can stop looking now. We know, we know where they are. They're, they're essentially everywhere we look. Um, and um, another uh, a quote that I pulled from that article just to say is, well, what about these micro microplastic particles? Um, the, the, how do these plastic particles compare to other particles that are present in the environment? And so, so you know, in, in, you know, essentially in the, by this, this quote here, 4% of the, of, the, of the particles are, are plastic particles. The other 96% of particles are comprised of natural materials. So how much should we worry about these plastic particles in the context of, of health? Certainly a question that we should, should consider. And so while we know that plastic particles are, are, are present in our, nearly all of the environments where they've been assessed, assessing harm is the hard part. And how do we determine how important these plastic particles are compared to other things? How should we address them? What, is the, what, is, what are the key uh, scientific and, and public policy questions that need to be engaged in to, to develop uh, uh, this appropriately? So moving on, uh, we'll, we'll get to, to, to some of the research that I wanna talk about that's, that's come from, from my group here, but just a couple more things here in that, you know, perhaps more than any other issue, this, this, this topic of plastics has captured public attention, right? And, and some of that is because these, these charismatic marine animals, um, you know, get tangled up in plastics. There's large, large expanses of plastics in, 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 in different environments. We see them on our beaches, we see them in our, in our natural environments. And, and that makes them different than other types of of uh, anthropogenic contaminants. So, so other substances that, that, that may be much more toxic than plastics are, um, but we don't see them and, and, and therefore they don't get the same type of attention. So we have to recognize that plastics have, have, a, have a, uh, a public attention, which is, is different than other types of substances and other types of impacts 
uh, on the environment. So we know that where the plastic particles are coming from. So a lot of, of, of reports on this. So there's plastic particle, or plas large plastic items that over time may, may fragment uh, in the environment. Tires, as tires wear, they produce small, small particles. Those are released. Past plastic pellets that are produced deliberately and in a pelleted size for various applications, uh, pharmaceutical products, uh, abrasives, paints, washing of clothing, um, the, these types of things. So there's lots of plastics produced. And so in, in, in plenty of, of, of numbers available on that, uh, 320 millions of tons uh, produced in 2021. If we look back all the way to, to 1950, about 7,000 million tons of plastics have been produced. And there, there, these, this amount of plastic production appears to be increasing annually. We know how they get into the environment. So, so they're, they're getting into the environment through waste, uh, wastewater streams, through, through runoff off of land and roads, uh, uh, in our uh, uh, landfills and plastic particles that are inappropriately disposed, bestows, uh, disposed of end up contaminating in the environment and being present there. Um, we also know in our in our own houses, right? So if we sweep the sweep the floor in the house, we can see there's plastic particles. We see the dust in our house. A lot of that dust is composed of fibers, plastic fibers from our furniture, from our clothing, uh, and from our plastic products. And because plastics have such a long um, duration in the environment, those those plastic fibers and particles can persist for for very long periods of time and accumulate. Uh, and then in our local environment, of course, also we see plastics on our beaches. We can appreciate that plastics are flowing down our, our, our rivers. Uh, they're entering the, the, the uh, surface of, of, of oceans. They may, they may have some, some positive buoyancy for some period and float around on the surface for some time. They may persist in the water column. And there's also plenty of evidence that they are accumulating at even in the deepest parts of, of the oceans. We know that they accumulate in in um, in the in the in in the, in the global sense. They accumulate in the gyres in the, in the oceans. There's been certainly plenty of reports of 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 what's what's present in these gyres in terms of these large accumulations of plastics being present there. So in the in the context of of plastics, you know, we appreciate this the presence of plastics in our environment. We see that that has a certain impact on us when we see an environment where plastics occur. If we go on holiday, we're not interested in going into a place where there's a lot of plastic litter on the beach. We'd like to go to a nice clean beach. We appreciate that that this is a big problem. Um, and we also, you know, perhaps have started to think about the concept of a circular economy. And right now, the, 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 the plastic economy is, is really a, a, a what we can consider a linear economy. So the plastic is made, it's used in packaging or whatever use, and then it's disposed of. And, and whether it's disposed of properly or not, some component of it enters the environment and, and is, is, is released in that way. And we can see, okay, if we think about a, a, the concept of a, a circular economy, it'd be nice to be able to, to make the product, use it, reuse it, remake it, recycle, and go around this, uh, this, this uh, circularity rather than having a, a linear economic model for plastics. But how do we get there? So, so the, this, and, and I think this is one of the things we have to be especially careful of, is how do we, how do we address the issues of plastics without creating bigger problems? And so there's, there's, there's been initiatives to how to give up plastic, how to avoid using plastics, transitioning from plastics to other, other, uh, other ways of doing things. And, um, but I think we have to also be careful about the potential that we're creating bigger problems by doing that in some contexts. And um, just making blanket decisions to give up plastics may not be the right one. A couple of things to think about. The, the, this, this topic of planetary boundaries is, is something that was put, put forward in an article in Nature by, by Rockstrom uh, in, in 2009. And the idea is that there's certain planetary boundaries uh, for, for certain categories of human activity. And so you can see around this wheel things like climate change, ocean acidification, biodiversity, chemical pollution, these things around the wheel. And what is what is the, the conceptually what's going on here is that when a particular when when uh, the particular environmental issue crash, uh, crosses a threshold, that threshold is 
a point at which you can't go back. You can't achieve what was what was um, what was the, the the previous state. And so we can see some some things like like climate change, loss of biodiversity. Once we've lost species, we can't get them back. So so these are, are planetary boundaries where certain things have occurred. And so this was put forward as 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 a conceptual idea of of some of the environmental issues and and where where some of our principal concerns are or maybe should be to, to at least have that conversation. And um, so you'll notice in the chemical pollution one, this article was, was not able to quantify at what point are we gonna cross a threshold in terms of chemical pollutants that, that we can't uh, recover from. So not enough information on that, on that, on that topic. And I, they have identified priority substances, including the persistent organics, had plastics indicated among others that you will be well aware of, endocrine disruption, there's disruptors, metals, and um, nuclear waste materials as substances that might be of concern that at some, you know, that there will be some threshold, but we don't know where it is and what the impacts of that might be. So um, in that, in that, in that context, we need to, to see, okay, well, where do plastics fit? How do we address plastics, for example, without uh, increasing some of the other other issues. How how do plastics actually rank within this in this context of planetary boundaries for some of the environmental uh, issues that we are confronting? So we want to ad address the the, the 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 issues of plastics without causing some other other problems. So should we stop the use of plastics? Should we develop new materials? For example, bioplastics. What is the what is the um, what is the potential impact of making something that's a bioplastic as opposed to a regular plastic should is it about um, proper design and, and 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 fabrication of plastics such that they can be readily recycled and reused what are the what are the international con, uh, challenges that we're confronting so so this clearly is a a global issue so plastics waste you know if you go into these gyres you can pick up pieces of plastic that come from all over the world. So, so addressing the, the the topic of plastics in in one location, but not as a global initiative, is not going to have um, an appreciable impact on the global problem of plastics that are, that are that are present in the environment. What are our contributions as scientists? How should we be in, in, engaged in that? And what are the what are the public responsibilities? So if we think about this, this topic of plastic particles and health risk, and again, because this is a, a lunchtime seminar and some of you are eating your lunch, probably it's in a plastic container or, um, you know, undoubtedly that food that you're eating has been in touch with plastics in, at some point in its delivery to you. And um, you know, we think, when we think about that, why is that? And, and, you know, what is it that that plastic has done for us? And it certainly has a lot of positive advantages. So, but let's think about the, the health risk. There's been plenty of speculation, but what about the evidence that exists for a health risk around plastics? So we might, might identify a number of questions. Are microplastics ingested? Are they absorbed and accumulate internally? So this word absorbed, when, you know, if we think about what that means, you know, in, 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 in my mind, what I like to, to offer that it means is that this is a, a plastic particle that is actually absorbed across, the, across an epithelial membrane to, to actually uh, enter the internal, um, the internal tissues of the organism, rather than, for example, just being on the external surfaces within the lumen of the gut or on the skin or respiratory surfaces, for example. Can it accumulate? Does it accumulate in the same way that, for example, a PCB or methylmercury might accumulate in, in the lipids of an organism? What about transfer in the food web? Does the accumulation in one, uh, one level of the food web lead to the accumulation in the next trophic level? And does that lead to human exposure? What about the substances that are attached to microplastics? So we know that, that the plastic polymers of which plastic substances are made, are not, it's not just the polymer in the final plastic product. There's additives that give plastics their properties. Um, and then when plastics are released into the environment, there's, there's, there's numerous substances that can absorb to those plastics. And what is the potential that those, those substances, when the organism uh, ingests them, will get exposed to those substances? Is that a concern? Are those substances bioavailable to organisms? And then are microplastics toxic? What, is, what does that mean in terms of toxic, toxicity in the context of plastic particles? 
And as scientists, we want to consult the evidence, objectively focus on the real issues, and, and have an approach that enables us to do that. So uh, I'll take you through a couple of different studies that we've, we've done over time. This is one of my, one of my favorite, um, which was done actually back when I was at Plymouth, and it was done by an undergraduate student that was, was, was doing a thesis with me. And I, I like it because it's simplicity and, and what the student was actually did. Very motivated student working on this. Um, this was Joe, Joe Hatfield, who's, who's gone on as a, as a graduate student to do, to, do, do very nice things. Um, and um, so, so what was done was to assess, we, we had the question, all right, what about uh, a crab, uh, a shore crab, if it is, is offered uh, microplastics, will they absorb them, will, it, will they accumulate? So what he did was to take um, some, some fish, uh, some mackerel, ground it up, and he made some fish pellets, and in those fish pellets he put in some plastic particles. And he put some, put, these were, were um, PVC particles, that is polyvinyl chloride, and, um, and there were specific sizes. He had two different sizes, and they had also treatments that had the same size of, uh, of, of, of sand particles, so the same size of a, of a, of a grain of sand for the, for the, the particles. And before he made the, made the pellets, he, he actually counted how many particles that he put in each pellet. So, so he, he actually went through all of that, counted them all out, made his pellet, and then, and then fed the fed the, the the pellet to the crab, and then over over a period of time, he 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 um, he filtered the water that the crab was in after ejection had occurred, and then and, and and during that process, he counted all of the particles that he got out, and what he found was that all of the all of the microplastic particles were found in the feces within three days. And so they passed through this, this crab quite swiftly. Um, the, the microplastic stayed and it got a few hours longer than sand particles, but it was a subtle difference, but it was, it was quite, quite similar in terms of, its, if it's, of its, if its passage through the gut. And, and when you think about it, a crab is, it, it must be quite good at processing particles through its gut because it lives in an environment where it's eating things like sand in, with ingesting that with its other food products. So it has to be pretty good at, at managing particles that are coming in with, with what it ingests. And in fact, that's what we observed. And, um, and so you, you know, ask, well, well, did they accumulate or not? Well, we counted all of the, all of the individual particles. So we know they all came out. So, the, so one question that kind, of, that kind of comes up, and I think this is, is an, a topic that we're working on quite a bit right now because of the interest in this uh, from the seafood industry and, and their concern that, that is expressed by, by, um, by the public in terms of the safety of seafood products because when people see the amount of plastics that are in the marine environment and a lot of the plastic issues are, are, are really pointing to what's visible in the marine environment where there are these gyres of plastics and, and marine organisms entangled in plastics. And so one wonders then, well, what about the safety of our seafood? Are we at risk from ingesting plastics because of the seafood that we're eating? Um, and so we, we were interested in, in assessing that. Um, and I had a postdoc who was working on a project. Her name was Anna Caterino. And part of her project was to go around uh, the, the coast of, of Scotland, collect mussels, and then assess the amount of microplastic particles that were present in those muscles. And so she went around the coast, brought them in back to the laboratory, developed a digestion method to extract the, the, the plastic particles from the tissue, and then quantified those. So it was a tedious process to, to quantify those. But what she found was, a, a, you know, just to summarize, was a couple of particles per muscle was what she found. And so, so quite quite low levels of, of plastic particle contamination in these in these muscles, and um, at the same time, I was getting calls from from um, journalists asking me, well, well, we're going to press in 15 minutes, and can you give me a quote to say how how much risk humans are for for um, con for consuming mussels from from Scotland. Uh, is this something that, 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 you know, that they should, should be worried about? And I was reluctant to comment on that, but it, what it did in, uh, incite in me was, well, we need to put these results into context. And um, the, the objective of this, of this study was simply to identify what was present out there in the mussels. Could we use the mussels as an indicator species to, to, to tell us how many microplastics are present in a particular environment? Those were the nature of those objectives. But it was because of the journalists asking me that I said, oh, okay, we wanna put this into context. 
And, and that ended up sort of leading to the, to the, to the perhaps even more interesting aspect of the study. What we did was to, to put some uh, sampling, uh, uh, essentially um, do a sampling of, of people's homes and, and essentially ask the question, if you're eating a plate of mussels and um, in your house, and are you, are, should, if you're worried about ingesting microplastics, should, be, should you be worried about the microplastics that are in the mussels or should you be worried about the number of microplastics that are actually falling on the plate from the air in your house? So those fibers that are present in the air, fibers that are coming off of your, of your clothing and your drapes. Uh, and what we found was that, that actually after sampling that and analyzing those samples, there was orders of magnitude higher amounts of plastic particles that we're exposed to through the dust in our house than from eating those mussels. And um, that, that's, that naturally created a, a much different story. However, then when the, when the journalist would, would call and, and, in, in, and we were giving responses to that, the question then fell on, well, okay, well, what about the effects that that might have on, on people and children? Are they more at risk than others? Uh, again, our study wasn't addressing that. We were just trying to put the context uh, attached to our our muscle results. So the question that that moving on from there, there's one question that we you know have as 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 toxicologists when we are when we're doing exposures, and it's something that I addressed quite a bit when I was working with engineered nanomaterials. If we expose an organism to a to a particle, is that particle absorbed? Is it truly absorbed across epithelial membranes, and is it accumulating in internal organs as um, as we would we would expect? Uh, to occur for other types of substances. And so we did it, we, 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 we uh, uh, did a study on that where uh, this was uh, Maya al Sid Sheikh who, who, who did this. She was a, she was a postdoc on that on that project. And what she did was to to produce some uh, 14C labeled polystyrene spherical particles in the nano size dimension. So she, she produced particles that were around uh, uh, 20, 20 nanometers and 250 nanometers in size. So very small, small particles, size of, of, of engineered nanomaterials. And the, the reason it, it was important to do this was because the, the, the tricky bit of assessing particles and, and accumulation is actually detecting whether the particle is actually present and, and, and are you detecting particle. And this has challenged us for, from, for engin engineered nanoparticle studies uh, throughout the period of, of their sort of popularity in investigating them. And um, so what we find here then is this method gave us a way of detecting them. Uh, we used scallops and so she put the, this, the, the plastic particles into the, into the water and then tracked their accumulation in the scallop over time. We found that the, the particles certainly accumulated. Um, it was, we did a, a standard uptake depuration type of experiment. So there was a period of exposure, this was six hours, and then a period of depuration. So depuration is when you re remove the scallops to a clean, clean water uh, and, and stop the exposure. So the only particles that are present are those that were, um, were uh, taken up by the organism. And then you monitor the depuration, that is how, how quickly those particles are removed from the from the from the organism. So what we see when we did auto radiographs of that was the the the, the high intensity areas here is where there were a lot of particles and then the, the lighter red areas are um, where the particles concentration was much lower. So what we can see here is that certainly particles were associated with the organism. Uh, considerably so, um, but what what is what is less clear is well, it's accumulating here really, but these areas are actually um, does not mean that it's internal to the tissue. It's actually likely associated to the external surfaces. So these are where the gills are. This is a, a the tissue has a lot of folds in it, and um, so it's 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 difficult to draw the conclusion that actually these these particles are inside. The best evidence that the, 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 the particles have been internalized is this muscle area here. So this is the bit we eat when we eat a scallop. So that's that white bit that we, 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 we fry with just a little bit of garlic and some butter and it's, it's wonderful. Um, and, and, what, and the reason this is, so what this looks like is that there is some, 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 uh, some signature of the C14 that's appearing there. And this is 
what we don't see this in the control. It's kind of an interesting presentation in terms of the shape of these of these um, of these uh, sort of globules. It's much 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 bigger than what the actual nanoparticle size is. And um, one thing that it suggests to me is that it's potentially um, cells that are involved in the in the inflammatory process that that have 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 taken these these um, plastic particles from the surface and brought them inside and then they're actually traveling around the internal part of the organism associated with those those hemocytes um, and then after um, after eight days we, we essentially see no more detection in that muscle tissue there's still some of the, the particles associated with the with the with the gills and hepatic pancreas it's taking some time to depurate and um, uh, uh, so, so there's there's some some evidence certainly that these particles are associating with the organism. They're depurating quite quickly, which is which is uh, consistent with a substance that's sticking to the external surfaces of the organism, and then the organism is sloughing that as we would expect it to, as uh, as an aquatic organism. Um, also did some experiments with fish. This is a trout in which we 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 put the these same plastic particles into a pellet fed the fish the, the, the plastic particles, and then did auto radiographs on that. And so what we see here is that these, the, 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 the particles are residing within the, within the GI tract. This is part of the stomach, the intestine. These bits here are intestinal CK, which is part of the, it's connected to the intestinal system. So this is, this is actually um, uh, um, little finger-like projections of the intestine that are, that are um, essentially they, they terminate, um, but they're, they're finger-like projections coming off of the intestine. So this, this is not evidence of it being inside, it's just inside the lumen of these intestinal CK, which are, which are connected to the, to the intestine. But we don't see accumulation of particles. There's essentially no difference in the control for the skeletal muscle, the liver, these other tissues uh, that are around. It's really limited to this, to this GI tract. Okay, so uh, what can we say about the microplastics in seafood and, and what is the risk uh, to, 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 to humans there? So we can certainly see that the, you know, the exposure in terms of the seafood that we're ingesting, so, so the, the, uh, you know, an organism like a mussel, which is, which is filtering large volumes of seawater and potential to accumulate microplastics, um, appears to be quite low. Our results are consistent with, with other studies that have, have subsequently been done to assess how many plastic particles are associated with, with other filter feeding organisms. Um, and then there's, in terms of some, some fish and, and shrimp, perhaps for some, some uh, people that eat the whole fish of, of small fish species, there can be some plastic particles that might be in the gut of those organisms. Uh, so relatively small in number, but present. What we're not seeing is the presence of plastic particles in the in the flesh. Uh, that is the fillet of the of the fish. So if someone is concerned about a risk of consuming a a salmon fillet, for example, it doesn't appear to be that there's much plastic present there. And perhaps um, it, you know, if we're, we're concerned about plastics, there perhaps it's more a, 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 an issue about. The, the, the household that we're eating it in or, or, or the, the, the plastic fiber contamination that exists along the way for it to arrive at your plate. Um, so this topic of, of, of plastics and their transfer of bio, bioavailable toxins into organisms. So if you go out in, in, into the environment and you sample plastics, uh, plastic particles from, from, the, from the sea, and then uh, do extract the substances that are associated with them, you'll find that there's quite a large number of different substances present. So there'll be, there'll be uh, PCBs, there'll be DACs, there'll be PAHs, there'll be a, a, a large variety of substances. And just remember that, that the, 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 the president presence doesn't mean uh, that there's a risk of toxicity. We do have very sophisticated methods for detecting uh, substances uh, and can, can, can determine parts per trillion levels. And, and so, so just considering that, uh, what does that mean in terms of, of a toxicology aspect? Um, we've done quite a few different studies on that and using, using um, you know, assessing bioavailability by, 
um, exposing organisms to plastic particles that have been doped with different substances, and then assessing changes in expression of genes to see very sensitively whether those substances are getting uh, are, are getting released from the from the from the particle and, and and inducing a response in organisms. And most most of the time, what we find is that this the, the plastic particle is actually holding on to the to the to the to the contaminant quite well and it's actually removing it from from the environment and reducing the exposure to organisms in in in, in many situations so we go back to our list and we we can con consider you know what do we what can we say about a few of these things so are microplastics ingested so a clear yes on that we've all ingested microplastics today i wasn't eating my lunch during this seminar but you might have been and so to, while you were eating your lunch you were ingesting microplastic particles. I've had my mouth open and been breathing, and so I've probably been breathing in some microplastic particles in that context. Are they absorbed and accumulate internally? Well, so there's certainly um, uh, evidence that there, there, there can be some presence internally. What does this mean about absorption? So could the, the study that I started out with, where I was talking about the, 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 the 2022 study that documented the presence of plastic polymers in the blood, of, 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 of volunteers who donated their blood. Is that a, um, an evidence of absorption in the sense of a plastic particle of moving up across an epithelial membrane into the blood? Or is it perhaps that uh, a plastic particle uh, fell on the surface of the, of the lungs and a, an inflammatory cell uh, phagocytized that and then brought that into the circulation, which is, a, is, a, is also a possibility. So we have, still have some questions to, to be answered there. How does that compare with other types of particles? So, so there's certainly, you know, from the fish studies that we've had, um, the, the amounts that are that are accumulating internally are, 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 are rather low in terms of any kind of um, detectable bit based on our, our 14C studies. Um, so the, certainly the problem is different than what we consider when we consider persistent organic substances that are accumulating and partitioning into lipids or partitioning into specific sub uh, spe specific tissues within the organism. Um, what about transfer of the food web and human exposure? Well, certainly if we're if we're if if the the plastic particle is present in the gut of one organism and we eat that organism, then that can be present in our gut until we ingest it. But does that really can, can, you know um, mean food web transfer? Well, it's it's certainly gut to gut transfer. But but when we think about biomagnification and trophic transfer, really we're thinking about a, a, a substance that accumulates in the internal tissues as we move up the food chain, the concentration of that substance uh, is, is increasing from one trophic level to the next. We don't certainly seem to be seeing any evidence of that in, in the case of human exposure, and likely the reason for that is that it's just not, uh, not being absorbed in, 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 in any real appreciable way. That does not rule out uh, effects within the lumen of the gut. So there's been a number of studies that have been investigating what happens within the lumen of the gut on the micro, uh, microbiome and are there effects on that. Um, and there's there's still work to be done on that to, to ensure, well, what, what is happening and are there particular plastic particles or configurations of fibers and, and particle shapes that prevent their, their egestion or, or in, you know, lead them to accumulate within the lumen of the gut. And so we, we need to keep keep our eye on that one and see what's happening in that space. Are substances attached to microplastics? Definitely. Uh, are these substance, substances bioavailable to organisms? They don't appear to be all that bioavailable. The amounts that are present on the uh, on the plastic particles themselves appear to be quite low compared to uh, any amount that would trigger a tox toxicological uh, uh, response. But that topic certainly does get attention and will continue to do so. Uh, are microplastics themselves toxic? Well, I mean, as far as a, you know, from from a toxicologist standpoint, you know, the the consideration of plastics, plastics do not present a lot of interest as far as a toxic substance. That's why we use it. It's quite an inert material. It's good for our packaging. We have our our lunches in it, and it's not. That's not because it's toxic. It's because it's rather non toxic, and you know, we make um, those those things that babies suck on. What is it? A pacifier out of plastic. And so we're not really thinking all that much about how toxic it is. Perhaps some of the, you know, some things have, have created a bit of interest over time, some of the uh, plasticizers that are used with it. But, you know, if, if it, in terms of toxic substances, plastics don't rank very high. And how, how so then how, how important are these plastic particles? 
Um, so if we could, you know, kind of think back to our, you know, addressing the plastics topic and, you know, should we be stopping the use of plastic? What are, what are the, what are the alternatives? And, you know, one of the things that I see that, that's certainly happening over here in the UK is, is there's quite a lot of pressure on, on companies to reduce the use of plastics. And, um, but not a lot of, of reflection on what is the alternative or things that are done um, to replace the plastics and what is the, what is the impact of those things, for example. And just to give an example, imagine, you know, we, plastics is very good for making bottles and, and imagine the, the, the bottled liquids that we drink and um, how efficient plastic is for, for transporting those substances around. If we were to say, well, we're not gonna use plastics for, it, for that anymore, we're gonna use glass and imagine the, the increase in fuel consumption that would occur as a consequence of transporting that glass just for the weight of the glass. And you know, what are the impacts on that, on something like climate change, which perhaps we're, we're much closer to a, to a, a, a threshold uh, where we can't change. Uh, I am keeping track of the time here, so I, I think we've got about 10 more minutes. Um, so this topic of, 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 of how do we proceed needs to be informed by the whole picture, not simply just removing the plastics or stop using plastics. There's some places where we can do that. There's some places where bioplastics may, may be appropriate. Um, there's some places where you know, recycling, reuse, and, and, and consideration needs to be needs to be needs to be there but we need to be able to approach that in an objective and, and logical way recognizing the international challenges um, the, 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 the the issue of plastics sort of is 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 something that is a truly a global challenge and we have contributions to make uh, as scientists we have to be careful in the language that we use and how we present the information around plastics uh, and keeping things in in context. And, and the public also has some responsibilities to, to, to be informed and, uh, and, 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 and uh, receptive to communications about it. Um, this is a picture I took it, 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 it some time ago when I used to be in airports a lot. Uh, and and I, you know, this is a, 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 a situation that many of us find us in. So I was, I was in, in one of the shops in the airport wanting to buy some water. And, and I looked at this and I was like, okay, I, you know, let's say I care about plastics and how it's packaged and I'm a consumer and I need to make a decision about what I'm going to buy, right? And so each of these are really pushing, you know, a different alternative to the plastics topic. So this is, this is a paper-based bottle with a plant-based cap, and this is a, a 100% recycled and recyclable, and this is aluminum can. All of them are can take carrying water. Clearly, there's a marketing strategy behind each of these, pushing um, a, 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 you know, a way of, 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 of delivering water to me. And I stood there going, ah, right, well, what am I going to do here? And I don't remember which one I bought. Um, I think I probably went to the, to the, to the, to the bar and had a, had a pint. But anyway, it's the kind of situation that we're, we're confronted with. The other thing that I notice in airports too, in the, in the UK and other places, I'm not sure this, the state of this in the US, is that you'll go to throw something away and you'll have these different bins and you, you stood there wanting to do the right thing and you got this and you got that and you're trying to figure out, well, which bin do I put it in? You look in the bin, there's a mixture of everything in there and you sort of feel a little bit like you're, you're, you're just, you're, you're, you're sunk about being able to, to solve it. So we've got some work to do to make that type of thing work if we're gonna do it. Uh, we've been, you know, one, one way we have, 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 have started addressing this in a, a few years now, we've, we've established this consortium of plastics and sustainability and recognized that, that at Harriet Watt, we have a lot of, of, of disciplines that, that work on plastics in a lot of different ways. So, so pulling those together to, to address this topic of sustainability and, and how we can um, you know, lead multidisciplinary research to address some of these key challenges what is the, the, the context of, of education and how can we do so in a global context? Harriet Watt has, has, is, a, is a global university, so we have campus in, in Dubai and Malaysia and Orkney to the north of Scotland. And our perspective is very, very global and, and in terms of the, of the, of the agreement of what we're trying to do. Uh, let's see, this is my acknowledgement slide, and I think I have about five minutes left, uh, and so I will uh, acknowledge uh, so a lot of the work that I presented here are some of the key postdocs who worked on that. 
Um, and this is Anna Katarina did the muscle work. Um, to, uh, um, Steve Summers and, and Maya uh, Al Sid Sheikh, uh, and some of, some of my co-investigators Tony Richard Thompson and Steve Rowland. Uh, other projects came along the way, and, and, and work was done by David Boyle, Vicky Slight, and uh, Emila Frutos. And um, so with that, I will um, I think I'll stop sharing the screen and see if there's something that we can talk about. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Thank you so much, Dr. Henry. So, um, yeah, what questions do, do you have for Dr. Henry? And you can uh, verbally share them or you can put them in the chat. Uh, I have some questions. Can you help me? Yes, go for it. Okay, okay you go ahead. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Henry, for the informative presentations. So I have a couple questions. Um, first, I was just uh, curious about uh, the microplastic size in human blood. You mentioned that uh, the average size they found here is about uh, 150 micrometers, which seems high to me. So, because, like, you know, the red cell size is only about like seven, seven micrometers. So, do you have any idea, like, uh, how the particles with that large size can enter human blood? And, and the other question I have is that uh, you also mentioned that the minimum size they detect uh, in the blood is about uh, 700 nanometer. And I was also curious, like, how do we detect uh, any, the particle size and the microplastic size under um, 700 nanometer? Like, do you have any comments on that? Thank you. Yeah, yes. Um, so, so thank you for your question. I, I think I got most of it. I'll try to, I'll try to answer what I understood, what I understood. I, I may not get it all. So then please ask me again if I don't get it. So, so I, um, so I, I heard you mention the, the 700 nanometers as, as, a, as a, as a cutoff size. And let me just clarify that what I was talking about there was from that study where they assessed the plastic particles in the blood, what those investigators did was simply take the blood sample and then filter it. And the size of their filter was, was, was a filter that kept, um, that allowed things that were smaller than 700 nanometers to pass through. So that was a decision they made based on the filter that they had. Um, so so what, on this topic of size of particles, it's, it's been interesting over the years working in engineered nanomaterials and going to meetings and, and, and a lot of, you know, you'll, you know, especially some of the early meetings, you'd spend, you know, most of the meeting talking about, well, what size are we going to consider nano? This is nano, that's not nano. Um, and, and um, you know, so, um, you know, the, the, there's been various definitions that have, have, have gone on um, there. And um, uh, so, you know, the, the, the particles that we produced on the polystyrene particles, the smallest ones we produced, were around 20 nanometers in size. And, and one reason that we went that size, we, we made ones that were around 250 nanometers and then uh, 20 nanometers. And the reason we did that was that we wanted to really try to get a very small particle to see if that small particle was behaving differently. And, and you, know, you know, in terms of absorption, one would expect that the smaller particle would be more likely to be absorbed than a larger particle, perhaps, uh, and um, uh, and and then um, uh, I think that you're you know I think I think I might have heard a question around what you know what size as far as absorption is is concerned, um, and, um, and 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 how that absorption is occurring. So so the the the, the easy answer for me to give right now is that we don't know. Uh, so if I was to speculate. From what I saw about the the, the scallop that we did the, the experiments with the with the 14C labeled plastic particles, my suspicion is that the internalization of those particles that we see in the in the muscle area that 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 muscle part that we eat of the scallop that I showed uh, is because the particles were accumulating on the surface of the tissue, so the gills, the intestine, and and um, and hemocytes. Sort of, sort of similar to to, to blood cells, um, can pass through that membrane from from the internal portion of the organism onto the to the external surface, and in that way, there's the potential for them to 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 engulf these these plastic particles and then come back inside the membrane, such that that we would then see them as being internalized. But to me, that's a different mechanism than 
the idea of how a PCB, for example, is, is genuinely absorbed across an epithelial membrane and then accumulating in an internal tissue, if you see what I mean. And um, so, so our reaction to that and our interpretation of what that means and how, how to manage that in a health system is different. So if these, if these particles are, are moving around in the blood inside an inflammatory cell, that's quite a different matter than if they are, are um, uh, just floating around in the plasma. And currently we don't know there that, that the study that was done in, in that context was looking at, you know, in whole blood, what is the, the presence of particles and didn't distinguish whether they were associated with, a, with the plasma inside a cell, attached to a cell. So those are questions that need to get solved. Thank you. Is there uh, another question? I have a question, Dr. Henry. Uh, thanks for your presentation. It was really great. Um, I just wondered, um, I know you really briefly mentioned plasticizers, um, and I just wondered what your thoughts were um, on, I've heard some people say like, you know, the use of these like more potentially toxic plastic additives really poses a threat to the success of like a circular economy since they're kind of released um, on recycling. Um, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. That may be a problem. Oh, yeah, yeah great, <laughs> great question. Thank you, Ashley. Very, you know, very, very good question. Um, a couple of thoughts to just say on that topic. Um, uh, so, so, so one one question that we've been interested in quite a bit is is whether substances that are associated with plastics, for for example, in the manufacturing process, are bioavailable or not. And we we stumbled upon something. Um, which ended up being a quite a, a, an interesting study. As it turned out, we were we were taking PVC, like you have PVC plastic pipes that you use in your house for 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 you know water and stuff like this, and um, uh, ground that up into small bits. And then uh, and then I have a zebrafish facility, and 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 we exposed the zebrafish to these plastic particles, these PV, PVC particles from the pipe. And, um, and then we applied a series of, 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 of gene expression biomarkers to see what substances, you know, what, what type of response the organism would have. And, and we, 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 we tested for estrogenicity, we tested for, you know, all of the, the, the typical ones. And, and to our surprise, we found an induction of the metallothionine gene. And this, this metallothionine gene is, is turned on in, in the context of detoxifying metals, at least in many cases, that's why it's turned on, it's not the only. Um, but we said, well, what's happening here? Why is that turning on? And, and so, so we, we, we repeated it got, it, got that same result, and then did further experiments to, to wash those plastic particles with acid and then did the exposure again. We did that and didn't get the metallothionine induced, and then, um, got the particles, the, the, the water analyzed from the particles that were not acid washed and found that there was mercury present. And um, our lead, pardon me, lead, uh, lead was present. And um, then we, and, 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 and it turned out that, that one, that lead was used in the, in the, in the formulation of the PVC uh, 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 pipe in order to give it certain, you know, properties that were, were desirable. But, but it was interesting to find, oh, right, okay, that lead can be bioavailable and actually turn on the, uh, the metallothionine gene. Um, and so I'm absolutely not saying that that is a concern necessarily for, for health, but it was an interesting documentation of the potential for substances that are within the, within the plastic matrix to be released and cause a, uh, a response. Um, your your uh, your comment on the the presence of plasticizers and and other substances that are present within within you know if we sort of consider that in the context of microplastics and our ingestion of microplastics or an organism ingesting microplastics, um, so so we've done some calculations on that and 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 to try to to say okay well well how if we consider the concentrations of substances that are actually detected on the microplastics and then ask the question, well, how many microplastics would you need to eat at that concentration if all of the substance was bioavailable? And you find that it's quite a lot of particles. So, so in order for you, like, so if you were to think about like how much benzoapyrene would need to be associated with, with, with plastic particles at the concentrations that you would find um, in, in muscles, you'd need to eat 
thousands of muscles before you would get to a point where you would even have a trigger of a, of a health advisory on those muscles. And so, so um, I think we just have to recognize yet yeah, there's substances that can be present. Those substances that can be part of the manufacturing process. They can be substances that are associated with the, with the particle in the environment, but, but we have to be conscious of the amounts and is that amount actually truly of toxicological concern. And um, for, for, for our part, we haven't found it to be um, a, a concern that's, that's raised up. Um, one, one study that I will point out, which is quite a, quite a nice study that was done, um, uh, that was looking at the presence of plastic, plastics in seabirds. And um, these birds, they, they looked at the, the, the amount of plastics that, that were, were passing through the gut of the birds, and they also tested the, the uh, concentration of persistent organic substances in the tissues of those birds and compared that to birds that were, were not, essentially didn't have plastics in them. And what they found was that the concentrations of persistent organics were higher in the birds that did not have the plastics. And the authors offered as a potential explanation that the plastics actually were sorbing the substances in the, board, in the birds and then passing them, ingesting the plastic and with the plastic that was ingested, that was leading to the removal of those, of those, of those substances. So, you know, the, 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 there's certainly potential that that could be occurring. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's part of the, you know, an objective examination of the, of the science of it should also conclude, or you should also include the, that result as well. Thank you, Dr. Henry. Um, at this point, we just want to make sure everybody knows what uh, is coming next month. And then if there are further questions for Dr. Henry, uh, is it possible for people to send you an email, Dr. Henry, for those that have- Oh, questions? of course. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I'm in this business because I enjoy it. So that's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I really appreciated your, uh, your presentation for us today. My so, pleasure. Alyssa, is there a, a slide you're going to put up about next week? Okay, perfect. So, I mean, next month on May 26th, um, we will be having um, a presentation on conserving mountain gorillas through a One Health approach by Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikusoka, who is the founder and CEO of Conservation Through Public Health. So I hope that you all will tune in and share uh, this opportunity to listen to this talk uh, next month. And um, again, Dr. Henry, thank you so much for being with us today and for everybody who came to the presentation. My pleasure. Bye, everybody. Bye.